Welcome. Thank you for viewing this video about the Carmagee Navassa Superfund site located in Navassa, North Carolina. My name is Eric Spalvins. I am the EPA Remedial Project Manager for the site. I will be walking you through this presentation. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, EPA modified the public meeting format to include this video as an alternate way for people to get information about this proposed plan. This video provides the same information as an in-person proposed plan meeting. The goal of this presentation is to provide information about the proposed plan for Operable Unit 1 of the site. Additional details are in the proposed plan and in the administrative record, which are available online at the links shown. The administrative record can be accessed by any computer. The community may also use computers at the Navassa Community Center or at the Leland Library. EPA is accepting public comments, which can be provided by mail, email, or by phone. Please submit comments before the end of the comment period to Eric Svalvins, EPA Remedial Project Manager, or to EPA Community Involvement Coordinator, Latanya Spencer Harvey. The proposed plan issued in 2021 replaces the proposed plan EPA issued in October 2019. The primary difference in these proposed plans is that the anticipated land use changed to include potential residential uses in Operable Unit 1. As a result of this change in land use, EPA and the state requested additional sampling. Based on the sampling results, about 1.4 acres originally included in the 2019 proposed plan has been excluded from the OU1 boundary in this proposed plan. The current proposed plan for OU1 applies to 20.2 acres that meet EPA and state criteria for a no action decision assuming residential land use. To understand the no action proposed plan, let's first review this typical Superfund process. The site is discovered and referred to the EPA, and if it's contaminated badly enough, it is listed on the national priorities list. The EPA begins a remedial investigation to understand where contamination has spread and what risk the contamination poses to human health and to the environment. If EPA finds an unacceptable risk, which I'll talk about later, then EPA conducts a feasibility study to develop and evaluate remedial alternatives that would address those risks. EPA presents its preferred remedial alternative and seeks public comment in a proposed cleanup plan. That's the phase we're in today. The EPA documents the final cleanup plan in a record of decision or a rod and follows up with the remedial design and the remedial action or cleanup action. When the remedial action is complete, the last step is to delete the site from the national priorities list. The Superfund process for OU1 and Kermit Univassa is a little bit different. The 2020 soil sampling identified about 20 acres that do not pose an unacceptable risk to human health or the environment based on residential land use. In this situation, EPA can skip the feasibility study and go to the proposed plan and propose what is called a no action decision. This is documented in a no action rod and there's no design or remedial action. EPA will be able to delete OU1 from the national priorities list in what is called a partial deletion, which will be the end of the Superfund process for OU1. So what is meant by an unacceptable risk? A release of hazardous substances must pose an unacceptable level of risk for EPA to take an action under CERCLA. EPA does not have authority to clean up all contaminants to zero or to take actions based on any detection of a contaminant. The statute and EPA guidance lay out the concept of unacceptable risk to guide decision making. For carcinogens, that unacceptable risk level is a 1 in 10,000 probability of developing an excess lifetime case of cancer. For non-carcinogens, the unacceptable risk level is if the potential exposure is high enough to cause a negative health effect. In the risk assessment, we calculate a hazard index to quantify the non-cancer risk. Now I'd like to summarize the site history, the investigations leading to the 2019 proposed plan, and the 2020 sampling that forms the basis of this no action proposed plan. The site was a wood treating operation located at the confluence of the Brunswick River and Sturgeon Creek. The boundary of the historic property is outlined in pink and the boundary of the Superfund site is outlined in blue. In the 1990s, Kermagee transferred ownership of the marsh portions of their property to the state of North Carolina. 
Most of what we know about the operations of the site are from aerial photographs. The wood treater started operations in 1936 and was purchased by Kermagee in 1965, which operated the facility until 1974. This photograph shows the site as it existed in 1969. This photo shows the site in 1975, after operations were discontinued. You can see the process area to the south. Next to Navassa Road is the firewater pond, and moving eastward, the wastewater ponds appear as a dark rectangle, and the evaporation ponds appear as two oval shapes. The wood that was stored in the OU1 area appears to be gone. Kermagee dismantled the plant entirely in 1980 and planted pine trees. Kermagee provided very little documentation about the operation and decommissioning of the facility. According to Kermagee, creosote was the only wood treating preservative used while they owned the facility. Throughout site investigations, EPA has required that lab analyses include another wood treating chemical called pentachlorophenol. It is important to understand that pentachlorophenol is present at a wood treater because dioxins occur as an impurity in pentachlorophenol. Until 2020, there were only erratic detections of this chemical at the site. However, in 2020, the multi-state trust reported pentachlorophenol in several groundwater monitoring wells. As a result, the site team agreed to add dioxins to the 2020 soil sampling effort. In the 1990s, the state investigated the site and rated the site as a relatively low priority. Then in 2002, creosote was found in the wetlands during bridge construction on Sturgeon Creek. And in 2003, the state referred the site to EPA. From 2004 to 2006, EPA worked with the Kermagee Company to investigate the site. In 2006, Kermagee created a spin-off company called Tronox that continued the investigations. In 2009, Tronox went bankrupt and was unable to continue the investigation, so EPA took over the sampling and listed the site on the national priorities list in 2010. In 2011, as part of the Tronox bankruptcy settlement, the bankruptcy court created the Multi-State Environmental Response Trust to manage the environmental liabilities from the Tronox Corporation. From 2011 to 2014, the multi-state trust operated with initial funding from the bankruptcy settlement. In 2015, the trust received additional funds from litigation against the former Kermagee Corporation and a company called Anadarko Petroleum. The investigation of the site through 2019 was based on the anticipated land uses of industrial or commercial land use. The risk assessments in 2019 found no unacceptable risk under CERCLA for those land uses. As a result, EPA developed the October 2019 No Action Proposed Plan, which discussed the fact that state statute would require land use controls, though land use controls were not required under CERCLA. During the public comment period, EPA received numerous comments from the community and from local government requesting a change to the cleanup decision so that residential land uses would be possible in Operable Unit 1. This proposed plan is based on residential land use. This is a change from the October 2019 proposed plan. The EPA and the state changed the anticipated land use in response to comments from the public, the mayor, and town council. In March 2020, the town council provided a letter of position expressing the town council's intent to pursue land use scenarios in OU1 that could include residential land uses. A key difference between estimating risk for commercial workers and for residents is the size of the area people would be exposed to, called an exposure unit. One quarter acre exposure areas are used to estimate the potential exposure to residents. The multi-state trust conducted a spatial analysis that incorporated the existing data and identified the areas where more samples would be needed. The result is shown in this figure. The 2020 sampling approach was finalized in the spring, but the sampling was delayed due to COVID-19. In August 2020, soil samples were collected in the polygons shown here in white and orange. The samples were analyzed for creosote constituents, pentachlorophenol, and dioxins. This figure shows both the historic and the 2020 soil sampling results. The blue areas are acceptable for residential use with no cleanup action and no institutional controls. The pink areas contain contamination above the unacceptable risk level for residential land use. 
The revised OU1 is 20.2 acres and can be used in an unrestricted manner for residential, commercial, industrial, or recreational land uses. The contaminants of concern for Operable Unit 1 include creosote-related carcinogenic PAHs, pentachlorophenol, and dioxins. EPA and NCDEQ provided concentrations to use as thresholds for determining if the exposure areas pose an unacceptable risk to future residents. OU1 was delineated to only include the exposure units where contaminants were below the unacceptable risk threshold for residential land use. As a result, OU1 is also protective for commercial, industrial, and recreational uses. EPA evaluated ecological risks and concluded that there are no unacceptable ecological risks in OU1. In 2020, EPA updated an earlier 2019 analysis incorporating the new soil data collected in OU1, the reduction of size of OU1, which excluded some of the most contaminated areas, and using site-specific food chain uptake factors developed in OU2. EPA's analysis concluded that for both high molecular weight and low molecular weight PAHs, concentrations are not expected to pose an un acceptable risk to insect-eating birds that could forage in OU1. In summary, EPA has concluded that OU1 meets the criteria for no action. No action is required to ensure protectiveness because there is no unacceptable risk to human health or to the environment under residential, commercial, industrial, or recreational land uses. This figure shows the extent of OU1 shaded in yellow. Remedial alternatives for the remainder of the site will be developed in future feasibility studies and presented in future proposed plans. Please submit your comments on this proposed plan by the end of the comment period by mail, email, or phone. The proposed plan and the administrative record containing all documents used to support this decision are available at the links shown. Once the public comment period has ended, EPA will respond to the public comments regarding this proposed plan and prepare the record of the decision. Feel free to contact me, Eric Spalvins, or Latanya Spencer with any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you.